this morning is in the cross of Christ I glory please stand as you are able and sing the first and the last stanza number hymn number 295 in the historic confession of the Christian Church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. 
The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. the Lord of all creation. Today, Lord, we need that reminder, as many here are suffering, suffering from loneliness, sickness, financial stress. In these situations of distress, we often have spiritual amnesia. Lord, your scripture tells us that your steadfast love never ceases. Your mercies never end. They are new every morning. Father God, just as you restore the earth in spring, so too will you restore all who ask in your name. For great is your faithfulness. As children of faith, let us pray as Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Our hymn of preparation is Tis So Sweet to Talk, Trust in Jesus, hymn number 462. Please stand and join us in singing.
let us worship God with his tithes and our offerings. You may be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to clearly see what you have given us and help us to generously and joyfully share it for your glory. Amen. the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 20 through 28. Now there were some Greeks among those who went to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world 
will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. The word of God for the people of God. God. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. We welcome you again to St. Paul. Please take this time to register your attendance. And as the children come forward for the children's sermon, please pass the peace of Christ with one another. Somebody, you send it. You could say it. You could send it. Yes. You could put it in the post office. Could call it on the phone. What do you got here? You could make a picture of it and try to convey. Sometimes, do you, do you know what my mother was able to do? Was able to tell me a lot of things just by the way she looked at me. Any of your mothers that way? Can they do that? Can they tell you something with their eyes? Can they tilt their head? You know exactly what they're saying without them saying anything? Kind of, okay. Yeah. Well, here are a few things um, we use uh, to get a message out to a lot of folks and who may not be listening. We use a microphone and this one's not attached to anything, but I got one right here. And when you talk into the microphone, it comes out that speaker up there and everybody can hear, right? Or we could use something like this. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, how about you? Huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we could, or we could, we could actually just cup our, our, our all right, yeah, there you go. See? We could cup just our hand. Do you know, listen, do you know what Miss Jeannie says back here in the choir? She works with our children, music and arts. There is a sweet spot in this sanctuary that without a microphone, you could just stand there and talk normally and everybody in the sanctuary would be able to hear you. Isn't that cool? There is a place like that. Now listen, there's a lot of times your mother has to give you this look or there's somebody that has to say, hey, Charles, you know, or say, get your attention. But a lot of times God wants to get our attention and he doesn't yell at us. He doesn't use a microphone. He did, uh, he gave us a great message through the life of his son, through his son. And Jesus showed us through his actions that loving other people is the way that you love God. Isn't that cool? That if you want to love God, you love others. Now that's not as easy as it is to say, but my prayer is that you pray for me I pray for you and we all pray for each other that we will slowly become more like Jesus in loving others. All right? You want to pray with me? Well, we got about four or five already ready to go like this. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, may you be the one who reminds us of your love and empower us to love others as you have loved us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>
I feel inclined to go ahead and have a benediction after that. Thank you. I, I look forward to um, y'all's presentation next Sunday during the 11 o'clock hour. Um, and I hope you all will mark your calendars and, and join us for that time together. Uh, pray with me, please. Gracious God, hide me behind the cross. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. For you, O oh God, are our rock and our redeemer. It's in your name we pray. Amen. There are some things that I remember as a child, and there are other things, probably like a lot of you, that you have chosen to forget. Uh, one of the things that I remember as a child is on Saturday evenings, going over to Chuck and Janice Cook's house while my mom and dad played Chuck and Janice Bridge. Uh, I was the youngest of four boys, or I, and I still am, unfortunately. There's about eight years between me and the next one, so I wasn't old enough to stay home and alone, and I never knew why my mom and dad wouldn't let me stay at home. Maybe it was Saturday Night Live and maybe what Chevy Chase would teach me, but needless to say, some part of me loved going over to the cooks because she would always make snickerdoodles and chocolate chip cookies and pie. Oof, almost time for a benediction there. One of the things that I loved about the cooks was Charlie had, uh, believe it or not, he was deaf. I mean, completely could not hear. He wasn't just hard of hearing. He could not hear at all. He, ha he had a hearing aid in, and, and if you ever saw him do this, you knew that he was tuning you out. He had that ability to turn you off if he didn't want to hear you anymore. Unfortunately, Janice was more often than not the recipient of that great tool. I've always wondered why these technological gurus have not come up with this device called I Tune You Out. Um, but I don't know, maybe it's in the works. But have you ever wanted to tune somebody out? Husbands, be careful. Boyfriends, be careful. I mean, the answer is no, absolutely not. Uh, what, what, what happens is uh, a lot of times we don't have the contraption or the technology to actually turn off our hearing aid where we don't hear anything anymore. Uh, what, we ha what we do is the noises around us become nothing more than white noise. You, you know what white noise is. It's things that you hear over and over and over again that you no longer recognize, never notice any longer. Uh, I guess it has a lot to do with familiarity. Lisa and I grew, uh, spent some time in Wilmore, Kentucky on two occasions. Uh, Asbury College and Asbury Seminary what is what brought us to that Mayberry-like town. There are a lot of other reasons why people come to that city 14 miles away from Lexington, Kentucky. But one of the things that does not necessarily draw a lot of people is the high train traffic in that town. I'm talking 48 times a day. It's about every 30 minutes a train comes through downtown and blows its whistle. About every th all day long, all night long. And when we first were there, it was like, this is ridiculous. I, I don't know how anybody puts up with this noise all around us, but soon we were able to sleep and our house was far enough away from the tracks that our medicine cabinet didn't shake, but we started to tune it out. We were only reminded of the train noise when we had out-of-town guests that would come back and say, how do you do, do what? Well, what's amazing is when we went back many years later to, to uh, finish up our seminary, uh, one of the things that was interesting to me at least was that it was like riding a bike. That train, what, we never heard that train anymore. I guess we do this in a lot of other areas. It's just not trains. It's, it's sometimes people. I mean, I mean, when John and Anna were young and, and there was, I mean, infant young, uh, and there was a stir in the crib, what do we do? We, we woke up. We were startled by that stir. Now, Katie, it's white noise. 
Now be careful, we're good parents, all right? It's just we've learned to overlook some things that uh, don't necessarily, never mind, I'm not even gonna finish there. I, I guess what happens is many times we become preoccupied with the immediate things around us that other things and other people are white noise. Maybe we don't choose that, it's just we've trained ourselves to do certain things and tune out others. I guess what's most startling and maybe most unfortunate is this, that many Christians and even pre-Christians hear God's voice as nothing more than white noise in their lives. The reminders week after week, whether it's in corporate worship, whether it's in Bible study, whether it's in devotion, whether it's prayer, we, we for that one moment, become engaged. But what happens is the simple reminders throughout the day of living out our lives, to love other people, to pray for our enemies, nothing more than white noise. Make, make no mistake that Every passage of Scripture, whether explicitly or implicitly, every passage shares and tells of that wondrous love of God. Especially our passage. Our passage does this. Let me set the context. Over the last seven or eight days for Jesus... Everything has been building with excitement. You had the raising of Lazarus from the dead in, Beth, uh, in Bethany in John chapter 11. And just that alone brought many, many people to Jesus. And, and, and as that excitement grew with the crowds and his disciples and his fans, the hatred grew with the religious leaders too. In fact, what they, it grew so much, that hatred. They didn't only want to get rid of Lazarus, or rather Jesus. They wanted to get rid of Lazarus too because he was the only living proof that Jesus raised him from the dead. I mean, who can argue with Lazarus? No, I'm, I'm not dead, really. You pinch me. I'm, I'm here. They wanted to get rid of him too. And this built to the point where there, there was this triumphant entry. People laying down palms, singing praises, bringing God. I bet you if Jesus would have let them, he would have been emperor that day. And here comes this, these two or three verses leading up to ours that kind of bring this to a a point. John says in verse 17 and 18, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. And the reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. And so the excitement grew. You notice what happens John takes an interlude in our passage, or in his book, to tell us about these Greeks that are coming. And these Greeks didn't have, I guess it is the common uh, accepted practice is that it's not what you know, it's who you know. And so they found Philip and they found Andrew, Philip found Andrew who had similar ethnic background or at least a similar Greek name. And, and they thought maybe if they got them to go to Jesus, then Jesus would pay him some attention. They, they wanted to see this man and get, find out what all the hype was about. But you know what's interesting? Is that Jesus never answers their question. J John never tells us what the Greeks ask him. We, we don't know why the Greeks came, what they asked Jesus. What Jesus said to them, if that even happened. All we know is that John includes this coming of the Greeks 
as a catalyst to the hour. That, that's a theme in John's gospel. Throughout John's gospel, there is this thread that is woven that, that Jesus speaks of this not yet hour, this not yet time that is approaching where he would be glorified, where glory would be brought to him. Now this excitement was mounting. And it's hard for me, as, and let me just read that one verse there where Jesus addresses this hour. And when the people came and when Andrew and Philip went to Jesus and said, there's these folks that want to see you, Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, when we think of glorified, in church, we might think of one thing, but I bet you outside of church, you're probably not any different from me that the first thing that pops into your mind is the pat on my back. I want to be recognized. It's an earthly recognition. And, and we sometimes find ourselves driving and doing things and being concerned with so much with the immediacy that's around us that what we decide to listen to or what we decide to be occupied with is where can I get the glory? Now, you may not be that way as much as I am, but it is a hard thing to overcome. And it would have been easy for this to be what Jesus was talking about. To bring glory to my name. To bring the accolade, the pat on the back. I mean, he had it all wrapped up. I mean, he could turn water into wine. Who would not want him to be a part of their fraternity? He could turn a couple loaves and a few fish into a meal for thousands. Who would that they not want? Who would not want him to be a part of their community? He could heal the invalids. He could raise people from the dead. Who would not want him to be a part of their health care? I mean, Jesus was on the cusp, on the crux of, of being the one who could ride into Jerusalem and take it over and be king. That's as long as if he wanted and desired that immediate gratification. It would have been easy, I think. I mean, we sometimes forget that Jesus was not only divine, he was human. And there was this desire in him, just like you and I, to be glorified, to be recognized. But you know what's interesting about Jesus is he was able to step back and see a larger perspective, to step back and see a greater purpose, because we know now being removed from that time that the glory of Christ, the glorification of Christ was nothing, nothing more than the suffering and the rejection of the cross. And throughout John, that's all been pointing that way. When Mary, his mother, said they've run out of wine in John chapter 2, he says, woman, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not come. It's not about me making small things happen around here without seeing the greater purpose of where this can lead. And do you realize we are benefiting from that greater perspective of Jesus? Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians is a book written to a church of non-Jews, of Greeks, people outside of the covenant, people on the, the margins. Listen to what he says. Paul says this in chapter 2 verse 12. Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to that covenant of promise, having no hope and without, without God in this life. And then listen to verse 13. But now, 
in Christ Jesus. You who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You see, the greater purpose was for the cross to be that focal point, that, that pivot point where others, the world, could reap benefits and be reconciled with God. This is something no one imagined in first century. But generations after generations after generations have been reaping benefits from that. Now, I don't know if the next couple sentences of Christ in this passage are centered around a teaching to his disciples or more of a reminder to himself. The, the grain that has to die before it bears fruit. And then he makes the connection that if anyone uh, loves his life, loves his, it's not his physical, their physical life, it's their ambitions, the desire to be recognized self-gratification, the self-accolade, the idea of getting the pats on the back, to being, to being noticed. If anybody loves that kind of thing, they will lose the impact that could happen down the road. But if you choose to let that go, then you will see greater results. You will bear much fruit. I've, I've been torn and, and struggling a little bit this past couple we, these past couple weeks about this, the, the pathos of Christ, his, his emotions. In verse, uh, verse 27, he says, my soul is troubled. As he sees that cross before him, as he sees the answer is not the pats on the, what he could do and where he could go and where he could be recognized. It, it was the cross that the Father had set out before him. And as he saw that cross before him, he said, what shall I do? Pray that the Father take this from me? No. He said, this is why I have come. I have come for this hour. Father, glorify thy name. This is not the only time Jesus was at a decision point in his life. Many other decisions, but about the cross. Remember in Gethsemane, his prayer was not, his prayer was, oh God, allow this cup, this hour to pass from me, but not my will your will be done. It was as if it was as if it was that, that Jesus could take a step back and see a greater purpose, a greater effect in following God, in putting to death his own ambitions and his own desires and seeing a greater picture. On one side, Jesus could have gone that, the, the way of self-glorification uh, on earth. But over here, he follows the Father. And, and I've been thinking, what brought him to a point of going from here to here? Because I'd like to know what I can learn from that. In one sense, I thought it was the, the stepping back. But that's not always easy to do. You know, we have to learn to tune some things out. We have to learn to listen to some things. So what practice can I do to recognize the greater purpose that God has for all of us, for myself, for you? And then I notice in 13, chapter 13, what Jesus does. He serves his disciples. At the end of chapter 12, 
Jesus' public ministry ends. And beginning with chapter 13, Jesus takes his disciples into a room and in there he begins a farewell discourse, a private ministry. It's, it's, a, it's the teachings where, where he goes over a lot of the highlights of things he wants his disciples to remember. It's not the trivial things. This is, this is the important things. And usually you start with the most important. And John 13 says that Jesus realized why he came, the authority the Father had given him, and he began to wash his disciples' feet. Serving others is so important that when he got to Peter, and Peter says, Jesus, you're not going to wash my feet. Jesus looked at him in the eyes and said, Peter, you're going to forfeit everything. If you don't let me do this, you will have no part with me. Serving God, serving other people, Become a, becomes a catalyst where we learn to tune into the people around us in need. It may start with small things, but the hope is that as we learn to do this in small moments, in everyday moments, that when those big kingdom moments happen, we will be ready to sacrifice our own desires and the, our own accolades. See, Jesus was so preoccupied with God's, the Father's, Father's purpose that we are the beneficiaries of today that everything else that screamed out into his heart, me, 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 became white noise. And so as we practice serving others, we begin to learn to see God's purpose for our lives. Why do you think we have St. Paul for all? Why do you think we help people at Open Door or Winton Neighborhood Network or bridge or other parachurch ministries in our community and abroad. Why do we do that? Why do we have opportunities to serve? Because our thinking is that in groups it's easier to serve. And hopefully these become springboards for us to serve at work, at home, in our places of play, in our places of, of, inter, of interacting with other people, that we will begin to see faces of Jesus in, in everyone we meet so that we will begin to see that our acts of serving are in essence acts of worshiping God. And we will learn so that these become second, second, nature. They teach us in the moments where it's easy to trust God in all hopes that when it's more difficult, the difficulty becomes white noise. And we go on and we do it. It's not automatic. It doesn't happen overnight. I was talking to Matthew and Tammy Reynolds earlier today. They have been a mem member of our church for 13 years. In fact, they first came to our church responding to an ad that we had in the newspaper of a Thursday at night program, and we were so ready for them that every door was th of this church was locked except one. And they went to about seven different doors to find an unlocked door. Thank goodness they continued and were persistent. But if you were to ask them 13 years ago, would you be willing to spend a month a year in Ukraine? 
they would have said, nope. How did they get there? They got there by focusing on serving in the little times, in the easy moments, where it became second nature to see the face of Christ in everyone they met. Jesus practices this art of servanthood. He's preoccupied with God's kingdom. And everything else becomes white noise. Oh, how wonderful it would be to be able to tune out those desires and those calls from within each of us to be number one. Be like Mr. Cook and turn our hearing aid off. To live in Wilmore long enough that the train is just white noise. It doesn't happen overnight. But the more that we worship and work together at this, if we let it, it can have an effect far beyond our imagination for generations to come. My prayer is that over the next week, you find one person that has been white noise to you. And you pray and ask God, how? How can I show them love? Show them your love with the only purpose of glorifying your name and furthering your kingdom. I'm going to try. I hope you'll join me. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we go from this point, we pray that you will allow the Holy Spirit to seal this into our hearts. That we practice servanthood. That Jesus is just not a a trophy on the wall that he that we realize that he was tempted in every way like we are to allow himself to be number one yet he is without sin so may we learn from his practices to put your purpose first your kingdom first for the sole purpose of bringing glory to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, our hymn of consecration this morning is hymn number 452. 452. Please stand as you are able and join us in singing.
benediction. May the peace of God and the love consistently and continually remind you that you are His and He is yours.